And out of dust, God creates the first man, Adam, and breathed into him the breath of life. And in the middle of the garden, he plants the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Serpent tells Eve, I know what God has said, but if you eat this fruit, you won't die. You'll just get really smart. Throughout the annals of history, the Garden of Eden has held a spellbinding fascination for humanity, veiled in enigma and charm. Despite myriad fruitless endeavors to locate it, a recent expedition purports to have unraveled its whereabouts, potentially unveiling the long-lost utopia. Could this revelation be authentic? Has the fabled Garden of Eden finally been uncovered? Join us as we delve into the pioneering discovery made by archaeologists in their pursuit to reveal the truth behind the Garden of Eden. Archaeologists have just unearthed mankind's most profound revelation yet, the legendary Garden of Eden, the divine sanctuary gifted to Adam and Eve by God. For generations, historians and scholars have tirelessly sought the purported site of this legendary garden, but their endeavors have always culminated in disillusionment. That is, until now. A team of archaeologists spearheaded by Dr. John Smith has ultimately succeeded in locating the Garden of Eden. Dr. Smith, who has devoted years to immersing himself in the study of ancient texts and artifacts, achieved the groundbreaking breakthrough after chancing upon a cave in northern Iraq. Within this cavernous enclave, he and his fellow researchers unveiled an extensive labyrinth of subterranean passageways unveiling the long-lost paradise that has ensnared the collective imagination of humanity for ages. The team stumbled upon a vast chamber after weeks of meticulous exploration. It was extraordinary, adorned with a cascading waterfall and teeming with lush, verdant flora and fruits. They swiftly discerned the exceptional nature of this cavern. The flora displayed genetic distinctions from known species, strikingly reminiscent of the botanical descriptions in ancient texts. Moreover, the artifacts unearthed within the cave offer tantalizing glimpses into the era when Eden purportedly thrived. The cave stirred profound intrigue among the researchers. Within its depths lay an array of unfamiliar plant species, defying the bounds of their prior botanical knowledge. The presence of non-indigenous vegetation stood in stark contrast to their accustomed surroundings. Meanwhile, the artifacts exuded an ancient aura offering tangible evidence of a primordial epoch. The researchers stood in awe of their discovery, the biblical depiction of Eden as a pristine paradise, adorned with resplendent flora and shimmering rivers, resonated deeply with their findings. According to Genesis, Eden was situated to the east, and this locale mirrored that description, exuding an aura of loveliness and purity. It was a realm where the first humans coexisted harmoniously with nature, living in serene communion with their surroundings and one another. The garden boasted the presence of four rivers, Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. Its climate remained temperate throughout the year, never excessively hot nor cold. It resembled an eternal spring, where flowers perpetually bloomed and fruits remained ever ripe. Eden's orchards yielded bountiful fresh produce with each passing season. According to biblical accounts, the garden housed an array of visually captivating and nourishing trees, including the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Described as a breathtaking sanctuary in the Bible, the Garden of Eden teemed with a rich diversity of flora and fauna. It was believed that various animals, including tigers, bears, lions, and other creatures, coexisted harmoniously with Adam and Eve and one another within its confines. This groundbreaking revelation prompts the long-awaited inquiry, where exactly is this fabled garden located? People have embarked on extensive quests in search of the legendary Garden of Eden. Some perceive it as a tangible geographical locale, while others interpret it as a metaphorical representation of spiritual wholeness. Nonetheless, for many, the pursuit of Eden's location has yielded no definitive answers. Its whereabouts have sparked numerous conjectures, with hypotheses spanning the expanse of the Middle East, Africa, and even the Americas. The enigma surrounding the Garden of Eden endures. While some scholars posit that the fabled garden met its demise due to natural cataclysms, such as earthquakes or floods, others propose the notion of its submersion underwater. One prevailing belief suggests that the Garden of Eden 
was situated in Mesopotamia, in what is now modern-day Iraq. This hypothesis hinges on the premise that the rivers coursing through Iraq, namely the Tigris and Euphrates, are the same ones mentioned in association with the Garden of Eden in biblical accounts. Additionally, archaeological evidence indicates that the region may have harbored some of the earliest human civilizations known to history. According to an alternative hypothesis, the Garden of Eden finds its location in Africa, specifically in the vicinity of the Nile River. References in the Bible to the rivers Pishon and Gihon are perceived by some scholars to correspond to the Nile and its tributaries. This theory finds support within biblical texts. Moreover, Africa has yielded some of the oldest human remains discovered worldwide, leading some to draw connections between these findings and the Adam and Eve creation narrative. However, in light of the discoveries made by Dr. Smith's team, the Garden of Eden is believed to be situated in northern Iraq, near the borders of Turkey and Iran. The network of caves where the garden was unearthed is posited as the entrance described in biblical accounts. Terrier Stordalen has proposed an alternative perspective, suggesting that Eden is located in Lebanon according to the Book of Ezekiel. Prophetic writings draw parallels between paradise, the Garden of Eden, and the forest of Lebanon. Ancient mythologies also consider Lebanon as a potential site for the Garden of Eden. The earliest Sumerian equivalents of Eden may be linked to mountain sanctuaries in the Lebanon and anti-Lebanon ranges, as suggested by Edward Lipinski and Peter Kyle McCarter. Certain religious factions contend that the garden's location is specific to their own region, outside of the Middle East. Some early figures in Mormonism believed it was situated in Jackson County, Missouri. The Panacea Society of the 20th century posited its location in their hometown of Bedford, England, while preacher L.V.E. Calloway proposed it was near the Apalachicola River in Florida, close to Bristol. Jerusalem has also been suggested as a potential location for the Garden of Eden. Christopher Columbus, upon sighting the South American continent for the first time during his third voyage to the Americas in 1498, harbored the belief that he had reached the earthly paradise. Tsun Tai asserted in his book, The Creation, the Garden of Eden, and the Origin of the Chinese, that the Garden of Eden was situated in what is now Xinjiang. Speculation has also arisen regarding a gate discovered in Israel that potentially indicates the location of the garden. In Tel Lachish National Park, adjacent to Mount Hebron, stands a singular shrine dating back to the earliest temple construction dating to the 8th century BCE. This intriguing discovery lends credence to biblical narratives detailing King Hezekiah's efforts to suppress local religious customs. Collaborating with the Jerusalem Heritage and Environmental Protection Ministry, the Nature and Parks Authority, and the Israel Antiquities Authority, excavation efforts were conducted earlier in the year with the aim of delving deeper into the ancient structure and enhancing the development of the historical park. According to the head of the excavation, this gate stands as the largest ever discovered in Israel, dating from the First Temple era. The recent excavation aimed to unveil the remaining portion of the gate, which had only been partially revealed several decades prior in the northern sector. The gate's dimensions align with Lachish's status as a prominent city, as corroborated by historical and archaeological findings. Emily, overseeing the excavation, emphasizes the significance of Jerusalem in this context. The Bible portrays city gates as focal points of activity, where elders, judges, governors, monarchs, and other authorities convene. During the investigation, researchers unearthed benches likely utilized by these esteemed individuals. The Lachish city gate, towering at 4 meters tall and measuring 24.50 by 24.50 meters, now stands fully exposed. The city's main thoroughfare traverses between its six chambers, three on each side. Emily describes several artifacts unearthed in the gates and chambers. In the initial chamber, benches with armrests were discovered alongside a myriad of items such as jars, grain, scoops, and jar handles, bearing stamped names of officials or seal impressions indicating ownership by the king. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. 
subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. All right, let's keep rolling. Notably, two handles bore the seal impression of a horn, signifying their association with the king of Hebron. As for the belief that the Garden of Eden may be a mere fabrication rather than a tangible place, it's a viewpoint held by some. They argued that the Garden of Eden is not so much a physical locale as it is a metaphorical concept. According to this perspective, the journey to redemption or enlightenment mirrors the spiritual path symbolized by the story of Adam and Eve. The Garden of Eden in this interpretation symbolizes the state of innocence and purity from which humanity is expelled. Despite its biblical references, some may question the historical existence of the Garden of Eden altogether. Indeed, many individuals may attempt to dismiss the account of the Garden of Eden as mere mythology. However, it's worth noting that the narrative in the Bible portrays God as not only creating the garden, but also naming the location. Eden was specifically planted within this garden. The inability to discover it does not necessarily negate its existence. Moreover, references to the garden are not limited to the book of Genesis. The prophets in the Bible also make mention of it. Additionally, the tree of life, which is described as being situated in the garden in Genesis, is mentioned in Revelation 22, 1, 3. The significance of discovering the Garden of Eden cannot be overstated. Firstly, it lends credence to the idea that such a mythical garden may have had a tangible existence, corroborating numerous theories and folklore stories that have persisted over the ages. Secondly, it offers a fresh perspective on the story of Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden. Ultimately, this revelation prompts new inquiries into the narrative and its implications, prompting scholars to reevaluate the text to gain a renewed understanding of its significance. As highlighted in Revelation, Jesus again references the tree of life. The same tree of life from which Adam was forbidden to eat after his transgression is depicted as the tree of life that humanity will be permitted to partake of forever. The pursuit of uncovering the Garden of Eden hold significant environmental implications, particularly in light of the unique plant species discovered within the cave. These genetically distinct plants present an opportunity to glean insights that could prove invaluable in the development of disease-resistant crops capable of thriving in diverse weather conditions. While the endeavor to locate the Garden of Eden may be arduous and fraught with scientific challenges, it's important to acknowledge its potential benefits. Moreover, the search for the Garden of Eden carries the potential to safeguard the unique ecosystem within Cave Hill and its surrounding environs. By delving into the secrets held within this ancient sanctuary, we may uncover knowledge that not only advances agricultural science, but also contributes to the conservation and preservation of precious natural habitats. Therefore, the pursuit of understanding the Garden of Eden transcends mere curiosity offering opportunities to harness nature's wisdom for the betterment of humanity and the planet. Despite extensive research, there remains a lack of tangible evidence to definitively prove the existence of the Garden of Eden in history. The narrative finds its origins in religious texts that lack empirical scientific substantiation. Over the millennia, geological phenomena such as shifts in the Earth's landscape and climate have likely contributed to the alteration or even obliteration of any physical remnants of the legendary garden, be it through natural disasters like earthquakes, floods, or erosion. This perspective gains further support from the trajectory of human evolution. Human civilization has evolved over millions of years in a complex and multifaceted manner. It seems improbable that the location described as the Garden of Eden in biblical accounts was indeed the initial habitat for humanity. As we contemplate the mysteries surrounding this sacred site, the quest to uncover the Garden of Eden opens up numerous possibilities and dilemmas for future research. Exploring the depths of the cave system where the garden purportedly existed holds promise for discovery, yet it also poses significant challenges. Scientists must navigate the complexities of safely accessing the caves while ensuring the preservation of their delicate ecosystems. Despite these obstacles, the pursuit of knowledge about the Garden of Eden remains an enticing endeavor, offering the potential for profound revelations 
about our shared human history and the natural world. Indeed, future investigations into the area surrounding the purported location of the Garden of Eden hold the potential to yield valuable insights into ancient cultures that once thrived there. By delving into the religious significance attributed to the Garden of Eden, researchers may uncover knowledge about the development of agriculture and horticulture practices. The lush descriptions of the Garden of Eden as a paradise teeming with fruit trees, vibrant plants and flowing rivers evoke images of abundance and beauty. The fruits within the garden were not only delicious, but also visually stunning, perpetually blooming amidst a climate reminiscent of eternal springtime. Moreover, the harmonious coexistence of humans and animals within this pristine sanctuary paints a breathtaking picture of utopia. Therefore, the discovery of this fabled paradise has the potential to revolutionize our understanding of history. It could shed light on ancient civilizations, illuminate the origins of agricultural practices, and offer profound insights into humanity's relationship with the natural world. The quest to uncover the Garden of Eden holds the promise of uncovering treasures that may reshape our perception of the past and inspire new avenues of exploration and discovery. The purported validation of the myth of the Garden of Eden through the astounding discovery of its true location in northern Iraq opens up a new chapter of inquiry into the story of Adam and Eve and its broader significance. This revelation not only prompts fresh questions, but also presents unprecedented opportunities for further research that could unlock discoveries and insights spanning ancient cultures, agriculture, and the environment. Throughout history, numerous theories have emerged regarding the possible location of the Garden of Eden, with some suggesting that it can be pinpointed by aligning biblical descriptions with the landscape of the era. According to the biblical narrative, a river flowed from Eden to water the garden before diverging into four distinct branches. The first, known as Pishon, encompassed the entire region of Havilah, renowned for its abundance of gold, onyx, and precious stones. The second river, Gishon, traversed the land of Cush. The third river, Hittikul, originated east of Asher, while the fourth river was Parat. Even upon a cursory examination of these passages, it becomes apparent that the biblical text describes four rivers, Pishon, Gichon, Hittikul, and Parat, all of which are believed to have their origins in the Garden of Eden. This alignment between biblical accounts and archaeological findings serves as a tantalizing catalyst for further exploration, promising to unveil deeper layers of understanding about humanity's ancient past and the mysteries surrounding the fabled paradise. The interpretation provided by the esteemed biblical scholar Rashi sheds intriguing light on the identity of the Pishon River. Rashi associates the term Pishon, meaning gushing forth and overflowing, with the Nile River, which historically overflowed its banks to irrigate the fertile lands of Egypt. Additionally, Rashi suggests a linguistic connection between Pishon and the Hebrew word Pishtan, signifying flax. This association points to the significance of the Nile River in fueling the flax industry of ancient Egypt, which thrived due to the river's abundant waters. Furthermore, Rashi's analysis underscores the historical context of ancient Egypt as a hub for mining gold and precious stones. Archaeological evidence supports the existence of gold mining activities in regions such as Nubia, encompassing modern-day southern Egypt and Sudan during pre-dynastic periods. In light of these insights, Rashi proposes that the reference to Havila in the biblical narrative likely denotes a location along the Nile region, possibly within the territories of Egypt or Sudan. Rashi's interpretation offers a compelling perspective on the geographical and economic realities of the ancient Near East, enriching our understanding of the biblical account of the Garden of Eden and its associated landmarks. By delving into the linguistic nuances and historical contexts embedded within the text, scholars like Rashi provide valuable insights that deepen our appreciation of the ancient narratives and their relevance to the broader tapestry of human civilization. The interpretation proposing the Pishon River as the Ganges River introduces a fascinating perspective on the geographical context of the biblical narrative. Advocates of this interpretation point to Yonatan ben Uziel's translation, which equates the region of Havilah with Hindki, an Aramaic term referring to India. 
Notably, Josephus, the ancient historian, also associated the Pishon River with the Indus River, which flows through modern-day Pakistan and India. This alignment with the modern city of Havilion, situated between Pakistan and Kashmir, along the upper reaches of the Indus River, further supports the connection between the biblical account and the Indian subcontinent. Moreover, the land of Kush, traditionally linked with Ethiopia, offers insights into the identification of the Gichin River as the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile originates from Lake Tana in Ethiopia and converges with the White Nile in Khartoum, Sudan, forming the Nile River that flows into Egypt. R. David Kimchi, a notable biblical commentator from the 12th century, elucidates the significance of the name Gaikan, which denotes divergence. This symbolism reflects the multitude of tributaries that branch off from the Blue Nile in Ethiopia, contributing to its powerful flow. Overall, these interpretations provide rich cultural and geographical contexts for understanding the biblical narrative of the Garden of Eden. By exploring the linguistic and historical nuances embedded within the text, scholars continue to unravel the complexities of ancient civilizations and their interconnectedness across vast regions. The identification of the Third River, Haidekel, with the Tigris River is widely acknowledged within biblical scholarship. The Tigris River flows from southeastern Turkey through Iraq, ultimately emptying into the Persian Gulf. The biblical figure Daniel during his exile in Babylonia described standing on the banks of the Hittical River while receiving one of his visions. This textual evidence firmly places the Hittical River within the region of ancient Babylonia, corresponding to present-day Iraq. Yonatan ben Uziel, a sage from the Second Temple era, provides further insight into the linguistic interpretation of the term Hittical. He translates it into the Aramaic word Diglas, which resonates with the modern-day names of the Tigris River in Turkish, Dikla and Arabic, Dila. This linguistic continuity underscores the enduring significance of the Tigris River throughout history. According to this identification, the reference to Asher in the biblical verse likely pertains to ancient Assyria, which was centered around the upper reaches of the Tigris River. The alignment between biblical accounts and historical geography enriches our understanding of ancient civilizations and their interconnectedness with the natural landscape. The fourth river mentioned in the biblical narrative, Herat, is commonly identified as the Euphrates River, which runs in close proximity to the Tigris. Together, these two rivers delineated a significant portion of the Fertile Crescent, often regarded as the cradle of civilization in ancient times. The name Euphrates finds its roots in various ancient languages, including the Greek Euphrates, the Old Persian Euphratu, and the Akkadian Puratu. Even today, the river is referred to as Al-Furat in Arabic. The Euphrates River holds considerable significance in biblical narratives, featuring prominently in God's promise to Abraham regarding the land of Israel and serving as one of the defining borders of the Promised Land. Additionally, historical records suggest that Jewish civilization once extended as far as the banks of the Euphrates, with members of the tribe of Reuben settling in these regions. While the identification of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers is relatively straightforward, the same cannot be said for the other two rivers mentioned in the biblical account. The verse provides more detailed information regarding the Pishon River compared to the others, yet the specifics remain ambiguous and subject to debate among scholars. Despite the challenges posed by these uncertainties, the pursuit of understanding the geographical and historical context of the Garden of Eden narrative continues to inspire exploration and scholarly inquiry. In Jewish tradition, the Garden of Eden holds both celestial and terrestrial significance. The celestial Garden of Eden represents the ultimate destination of the righteous soul following its departure from the earthly realm. Conversely, the terrestrial Garden of Eden refers to the physical location where Yahweh, the Hebrew name for God, created Adam and Eve, whom many believe to be the ancestors of humanity. Jewish law, as recorded in the Talmud, identifies this garden as being situated in Eden. Described in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Jewish Torah and the Christian Bible, the Garden of Eden, also known as Gan in Hebrew, is depicted as an idyllic paradise. Within its bounds, Adam and Eve experienced a state of blissful innocence, untouched by pain, sickness, fear, or mortality. 
until they transgressed against Yahweh's command. This narrative serves as a foundational element in Jewish theology, exploring themes of human nature, free will, and the consequences of disobedience. Through the story of the Garden of Eden, Jewish tradition offers profound insights into the human condition and the complexities of the relationship between humanity and the divine. The story of Adam and Eve's temptation in the Garden of Eden holds profound significance within Jewish tradition. According to the biblical narrative in the book of Genesis, Yahweh prohibited Adam and Eve from eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, warning them of the consequences should they disobey. In the story, a serpent, often interpreted as a manifestation of the devil or representing humankind's inclination towards self-destructive behavior, tempts Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. The serpent persuades Eve by suggesting that consuming the fruit will grant her knowledge and wisdom, making her like God and able to discern good from evil. Eve succumbs to temptation and eats the fruit, then shares it with Adam. As a result of their disobedience, Adam and Eve become aware of their emotional and physical senses, experiencing shame and guilt for the first time. This act of disobedience marks a pivotal moment in the narrative, symbolizing humanity's departure from a state of innocence and the introduction of moral awareness. Eve is often depicted as the original sinner in this story, as she is the one who first partakes of the forbidden fruit and then offers it to Adam. This narrative element has been subject to various interpretations and theological discussions within Jewish scholarship, exploring themes of free will, temptation, and the consequences of disobedience. Through the story of Adam and Eve's temptation, Jewish tradition grapples with fundamental questions about human nature, morality, and the relationship between humanity and the divine. In Islam, the concept of the Garden of Eden, known as Janet Adin or Gardens of Eden, holds significance as a heavenly paradise or city within heaven. It represents the fourth stage of Jannah, the gardens of perpetual abode, symbolized by abundant and exquisite pearls. Aden is described as a paradise where the righteous, patient, and pure dwell in magnificent mansions, surrounded by lush gardens, flowing streams, and inhabited by angels. In Islamic tradition, it is believed that Adam originally resided in Jinnit Aden before descending to earth. According to the Quran, Adam's descent to earth occurred from Jinat Aden to Sarandib, a place often identified with Sri Lanka. While the Quran refers to the garden without the term Aden, it is commonly understood that the Garden of Eden serves as the fourth layer of Islamic heaven. However, unlike in some interpretations of other religious traditions, it is not necessarily regarded as the specific dwelling place of Adam in Islam. Throughout the Quran, there are numerous references to the garden, which symbolize the ultimate reward for the righteous in the afterlife. These descriptions depict a paradise of unparalleled beauty and bliss, where believers are reunited with their creator and enjoy eternal peace and happiness. The concept of Yanat Aden reflects Islamic beliefs about the nature of the afterlife and the rewards awaiting those who lead a life of faith, virtue, and obedience to Allah. In Islamic tradition, Yanat, the Gardens of Eden, holds a position of supreme honor among the various gardens of heaven. Quranic exegetes and scholars assert that Yanat is unparalleled in its beauty, splendor, and bliss, surpassing all other heavenly abodes. Descriptions of Janet in Islamic literature emphasize its extraordinary nature, with vivid imagery depicting scenes that exceed the imagination and comprehension of mortal beings. According to a hadith attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, the gardens of Eden are described as beyond human perception, what no eyes have ever seen, and what has never occurred to any heart. This emphasizes the incomprehensible magnificence and splendor of Jannah. While the Quranic verses often provide metaphorical or symbolic descriptions of Jannah, some verses offer glimpses into its tangible features. Residents of the Gardens of Eden are believed to include various groups such as prophets, the sincere, martyrs, believers, and mujahids, those who strive in the cause of Allah. These descriptions underscore the inclusivity and rewards awaiting those who lead righteous lives and remain steadfast in their faith. Interestingly, 
Despite the biblical account featuring multiple trees in Eden, the Quranic narrative mentions only one significant tree, the tree of immortality and ownership of no decay. Allah specifically forbade Adam and Eve from partaking of this tree, signifying its sacredness and the divine commandment to abstain from certain actions. Notably, unlike in the Bible, there is no mention of a tree of knowledge in the Quranic narrative of Eden. Overall, the Quranic depiction of Janet offers believers a vision of paradise that transcends earthly limitations, promising eternal bliss and closeness to Allah for those who follow the path of righteousness and obedience. The idea that the Garden of Eden is a myth and cannot be located is supported by several factors. One such factor is the mythology surrounding its river system, which includes the Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates rivers. Attempts to locate the Garden of Eden by tracing these rivers have proven inconclusive as the geographical features described in the biblical narrative do not correspond with known landscapes. Moreover, a subset of liberal PhD scholars influenced by anthropological perspectives propose that the Garden of Eden is a symbolic reconstruction of earlier Mesopotamian myths. These scholars suggest that the biblical account of Eden shares similarities with ancient Sumerian stories about the city gardens of the gods and goddesses in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. According to these myths, the gods created cities and gardens for their own sustenance and enjoyment. The fertile floodplain of Lower Mesopotamia, referred to as Eden by the Sumerians, was considered the Garden of the Gods. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers which flowed through this region were utilized as irrigation channels to nourish the gardens. Over time, the gods grew weary of tending to their gardens and created humanity to serve as caretakers. Humans were tasked with maintaining the irrigation canals, cultivating crops, and presenting offerings of food to the gods in temples within the cities. This narrative suggests that the concept of the Garden of Eden may have originated as a symbolic reflection of these ancient Mesopotamian myths rather than representing a literal, physical location. In light of these perspectives, the search for the Garden of Eden may be seen as a quest to understand the symbolic and cultural significance of the biblical narrative within the broader context of ancient Near Eastern mythology and religious beliefs. The interpretation of ancient Mesopotamian myths regarding the creation of humanity and the role of gods differs significantly from the teachings of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. According to this perspective, humanity was not created out of divine love or for the purpose of fellowship with the gods as depicted in Abrahamic traditions. Instead, humans were viewed as agricultural slaves created by the gods to serve as laborers in the gardens of Eden, Eden. In this interpretation, the gods fashioned humanity to perform the backbreaking and laborious tasks required to maintain the gardens and provide sustenance for the deities. The gods, reluctant to engage in manual labor themselves, delegated this responsibility to humanity, thereby ensuring their own comfort and sustenance without the need for personal exertion. Furthermore, the denial of immortality and godhood to humanity was seen as a deliberate strategy to maintain the hierarchical order established by the gods. Allowing humans to attain immortality or divine status would undermine the gods' control over the agricultural labor force and necessitate their return to the toil of tending the gardens themselves. In the Mesopotamian worldview, the gods depended on humans to grow their food and sustain them, and any disruption to this arrangement would pose a threat to their comfort and power. Therefore, the denial of godhood and immortality to humanity served to perpetuate the gods' dominance and preserve the status quo within the divine hierarchy. Overall, this interpretation offers a distinct perspective on the role of humanity in Mesopotamian mythology, emphasizing themes of labor, exploitation, and divine self-interest. It contrasts with the theological concepts of love, fellowship, and divine purpose found in the Abrahamic religions. It's fascinating to explore the parallels between the biblical narrative of the Garden of Eden and the myths of ancient Mesopotamia. The idea that Genesis's account may have been influenced by earlier Mesopotamian myths offers a compelling perspective on the origins of this foundational story.
Regardless of the specific cultural influences behind the Garden of Eden myth, its central message remains timeless and profound. The promise of eternal life and divine provision for the righteous resonates across religious and cultural boundaries, offering hope and comfort to believers throughout history. As we contemplate recent findings and interpretations related to the concept of paradise on earth, it's important to reflect on the deeper spiritual truths conveyed by the Garden of Eden narrative. Ultimately, the pursuit of eternal life and spiritual fulfillment transcends geographical or historical considerations, inviting us to seek inner transformation and alignment with divine truth. Thank you for sharing your insights, and we look forward to continuing the conversation on this intriguing topic. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more thought-provoking content. Unprovoking content. Unprov if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.